Welcome to chapter 73 of the Strength Culture Presents Quantum Lifting Podcast. And we're here today with a returning guest, hasn't been on for a while, but John Paul Kiaki. Uh, for the, What's going on? How are you, man? For those of you, most people should know who you are, but for those that don't, just a quick and brief introduction of yourself. Uh, what's going on? Yeah, I'm JP, uh, powerlifter, powerlifting coach, owner of powerlifting gym in Melbourne, the Strength Fortress. Um, and I like all things lifting. Um, good friends with Jamie and Charlie for a long time. And uh, yeah, it's good to be, I guess, back. Back. You, on you've the, come on. On the podcast, it has been a while. <laughs> you were on early days, like when we were still mm-hmm. figuring out what the hell we were doing. Whereas now, I think we, we've upped the, the quality. Man, of you guys the are pros. Man, we've you're upped pros the quality now. now. We, we have. We've done, this is the 73rd episode. So we're only doing one every fortnight. But um, yeah, consistency. It's the same as what we're probably going to talk about today. Consistency of effort over Maybe time. Maybe that's the name of the episode. Do you have a name for that's, this episode? Maybe that's it. No, nah, we usually just make it up after. Once the, uh, <laughs> once we do the episode, we sort of see what we spoke about. Um, but I guess this, this episode came into fruition when me and you were having a chat the other day on Messenger. Mm-hmm. And... I think this couples really well with that video you just made. And I've actually listed the 10, the 10 things that juniors should know about powerlifting. Cause I actually think there's a lot of things in that video that can correlate to other aspects of life too. So I want to talk about that as well, but we both have started learning new skills, um, which you're learning Spanish. Plus you learn chess. I would classify chess as a new skill as well. Um, you're a bit more, yeah, would you yeah. classify yourself as intermediate? In chess, yeah, for sure. Chess, yeah. yeah, and so and I've started learning guitar. Probably nearly, it's nearly coming up on a year. Um, yeah. So we were discussing the concept of learning, learning a new skill, and how it very much correlates with everything we do as coaches with lifting. The same principles apply. Of uh, obviously time, effort, overload it needs to progressively get harder over time. Repet- just repetition, mm-hmm. Re- repetition. Mm-hmm. Your bit, literally, your brain is a program. Mm-hmm. That's how I look at it. I think the more you want to, if you want to learn Spanish, the more you just speak Spanish and fumble your way through it, your brain starts to wire itself to speak Spanish. How are you going yeah. with your Spanish? <laughs> Buenísimo. Um, really good. It's funny what you said about us learning new skills because, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing the other day. We're having a chat about it. Um, both you and I, I guess, are similar in that sense. We have similar ethos when it comes to learning, developing, becoming a better person. And lifting is one... I guess uh, one route you could say that you and I both have taken to improve ourselves, but it's only one. It's only one facet of our lives, and I guess that's why you've taken up guitar, and I've like taken up a couple of other things as well. I, I do like learning new things, and uh, one thing that's really common in language learning, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little bit more later on because I've got a lot of thoughts about this kind of stuff. But one thing that is often said in language learning and in the language learning community, by the way, the language learning community is massive, just like. The powerlifting community is a thing. There's a language learning community. Groups of people that just like all like learning languages. They've learned multiple languages just out of interest. That exists. And one thing that's really common is that once you've learned one, it gets easier to learn another, right? Like once you know, once you know Spanish and Italian, learning Portuguese is easier. Or even once you know, you know, three languages, learning another language, even if it's in a different family, it gets easier because you kind of develop systems. And while that's true in the language learning community, as in like, you know, once you know Spanish, you can learn nothing. I feel like that's very true amongst all skills, like even skills that are completely different because once you get good at anything, you know how to get good at things, right? And I think for you and I, you know, we both learned through our time lifting, how to apply ourselves, how to tolerate some boredom, you know, because I think tolerating boredom is an important thing. You have to learn how to do Massive. Because some, sometimes training, sometimes practicing your, your chords, Sometimes rereading the same fucking passage 10 times gets boring. You learn how to tolerate boredom. You learn how to concentrate. You learn how to be consistent. You learn how to do all those kinds of things. And once you've done it once in lifting, you just apply it to guitar. You just apply it to chess. You just apply it to whatever the fuck you want. And it's like unlocking a new power. It's like a superpower. It's like, oh, I know how to learn things. And I guess that's why I've started doing that. It's because I'm like, well, I wonder what other things I can learn or discover. And music's one thing that I haven't done yet, but I'm sure I'll give it a go soon. I definitely, I definitely recommend diving into music. I'm, I want to venture down the language route. I already sort of can speak a fair bit of Greek, but my grammar and my understanding of the language itself is pretty poor. So that's something I'd like to improve on. Uh, and then, you know, I've always set the task of 
learning another language down down the track. And I, I don't think we're ever too old. Like my my auntie is you know fifties and she's learning Italian. Um, awesome. So I know there's there's plenty of time. But music is definitely something that I think because I would like to learn the piano as well now. Now that I've started learning yeah. guitar, and as you What's said, once you yeah, learn guitar. It'd be a lot easier for me to learn piano now because I've started to learn scales and chord progressions and whatnot, all, all these basic understandings of music. And I think you could liken it to someone who's done powerlifting is probably going to find it easier to learn Olympic lifting because they understand hip control and how to move and how to squat and how to press a bar over their head. And so they've just got to piece those puzzles together uh, to, to Olympic lift. So Definitely, I definitely recommend. What what instrument would you play if you had to uh, venture into the music? Piano, yeah, piano, right. like keyboard, whatever. That was like at the start of the year when I was trying to decide what I wanted to spend the year doing because I've been studying Spanish since the start of the year, since January. I was trying, I was tossing up between piano and and language, so I chose language. But yeah, piano for sure. Crazy. Yeah, piano, I feel, is the one. If you want to be a musician, you have to know piano because you've got the treble clef and the bass clef on either side. Mm -hmm. Okay. You see, I know nothing about it. Like, I probably oh, know, know nothing about, about music. I know, I, know, yeah. I know nothing about music, and that's why it's like, it almost saddens me a little bit to be like, man, there's this whole thing that, like, people dedicate their lives to. I don't even know the first thing about it. So that's why, that's why I'm interested. That's what interests me, getting a bit that's of an insight what, into what other people yeah, do. Yeah, exactly. I feel like sometimes you get very caught in the bubble. So like you said before that there's this whole group out there of people that are, are learning multiple languages and they probably meet up together and um, they practice together or whatever they, they do. Yeah, man. There's, there's, this, there's this thing called the International Polyglot Conference every year. That's mad. Where like, you know, the polyglots of the world all meet up and they have like this, just like, you know, how you have the strength Congress, they have that. But for language, like it's amazing. It's awesome, yeah. That's man. That's man. Because I was speaking to Will Berkman actually about it. And I was saying how I'd like to play like live music one day or maybe play in a band. And he's like, you could literally find people that would want to play with you. They'd be probably of a similar level to you. And you guys would just get better by playing together. And in mm -hmm. time, because you're practicing with the, the drummer and the singer or whatever it may be. Um, but I guess for me personally, the, the real big driver to go and learn something outside of lifting was that coaching and lifting it just became everything and i wanted something to separate the two and that's probably was that a big driver for you to go and learn different skills like chess and um, yeah absolutely it's it's having other facets to your life other dimensions to your personality to your character you're not just you know you're not at a dinner party with your auntie and your family and stuff and all they know you as is the meathead guy who has it that works at a gym that does powerlifting you actually have some depth to your personality which i think is is very lacking in some people not just in the lifting world but in all in all communities people kind of get really bogged down into one one i guess one thing, one thing which, which, which i don't think idea. is even a bad thing yeah which i don't think is that even that bad like some people are just renowned for that in their whole life you know what i mean like like if you want to be the best of the best of the best you have to do that because if you even spend 10% of your time learning something else, the next guy won't, and the next guy will be ahead of you. But I mean, personally, it's just not something I'm interested in. I'm interested in learning new things, yeah, having hobbies that are outside of my, outside of my lifting, outside of my work. Yeah, I don't think, like, there's no real trade-off. It's not like you're going to be a worse lifter because you've gone and learned a language or spent time learning an instrument. Like, if anything, I feel like it's probably going to add to you your ability to learn and pick up on things and empathize with people and coach people. Because a big thing for me was that I started to understand what it was like to be bad at something again. So, you know, when you get a new client that hasn't really trained much, hasn't had a coach for, and they can't do simple movements, I sort of understood what it's like to not get it. How did you, how did you get started with your guitar? Like, firstly, I guess, what made you decide on it? Obviously what you said, right? Like wanting a new skill. But how did you pick guitar or was there other things that you thought about like that you considered nah. and yeah what was the first what was the first month like the the I, I would honestly say the first three months uh, even longer we were like pretty pretty hellish um because <laughs> you're watching all like these you're, videos you're self-taught self right like you did it all yourself you don't yes. have a coach or a, or a music, music trainer or something no nah, all self-taught and mm -hmm. to be honest there is a mountain of information on the internet like you could teach of yourself course. anything these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
especially topics like this big, like guitar, you know, that's a all big the way topic from there's lots of them. Yeah, from beginner to advanced. So if you are someone that is thinking about learning something, you can find it on the internet. Like we live in an age state where it is out there. Um, I, I chose guitar because I always wanted to learn guitar. I just liked it, like the sound of it. Like the funny thing is learning, starting to learn guitar, I've actually my taste in music has also changed. Wow, um, cool. Started listening to a little bit more like rock and metal, um, which I never, ever thought I would listen to metal. Um, more acoustic music, some bluesy, like electric music, um, like some even jazz guitar, because you start to, you want to listen to artists who have spent 15, 20 years, 25, 30 years of their life learning this instrument. And now they're at the top expressing what it can do. So you, you want to dive into the different genres of um, music. I think- I think what you're saying there really resonates with me. It's, I think that's what makes me interested in learning a bit of music myself is because yeah. like, it sounds like this last year has given you like this new perspective to view music from. You know, for me as a music newbie, I don't know anything about music. All I know is what I hear on the radio and what I listen to on Spotify. Hmm. I don't have that kind of like perspective, but it sounds like you've got this new you know, lens to view music from. Is that, is that right? Yeah, 100%. Because you start to appreciate the, the talent that goes in. And it's like you can't really appreciate something until you understand it. And it's like, mm-hmm, I'm mm-hmm. sure, you know, you and I would look at, I'm just thinking like Amanda Lawrence. I, mean, she's, I was, saw a video of her squatting 260 the other day or something ridiculous. Mm-hmm. And like, we appreciate that fully because we understand how heavy 260 is. And for a female to lift that kind of weight is just massive. Whereas you take someone off the street, they've got no context. They're like, oh, that's heavy. Of but they would probably also think a girl squatting 100 kilos is heavy. Like, um, mm-hmm. So you've got to sort of have that context. And it wasn't until I started picking up guitar, I realised how good some of these guys were. Um, mm-hmm. But at the same time, they've also been playing it for 30 years and probably playing it like... I know like Slash from Guns N' Roses, like they used, he used to play his guitar all day. Like he'd have his guitar in his hand all day. And that's why he's... One of the best guitarists of all time. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty... It, it did give me a new, like, sort of perspective on things. That's cool, man. Yeah. So, did you have you done much music before? Just in high school? Just just like in high school, yeah. Really nothing. Um, yeah, next to nothing. And that's the thing is, like, there are so many... Uh, so many... I don't even know what you'd call it. Like, topics or fields, I guess that people dedicate their lives in like you said slash or you know on guitar and you know they're like linguists out there and there are whatever i I couldn't even think of them off the top of my head but there are so many things that people spend their whole lives on and it's just i just feel like it's such a shame to like not be familiar with them and one of the things that i often say when i kind of think about this and or i'm explaining this to people is you know that saying um that everybody loves and everybody shares it in the strength training community that i think it's supposed to be socrates um you know, what a shame it is for a man to grow old and never see the strength of which his body is capable. I'm mm. sure you know that one. Yeah. Um, you know, no, no man has a right to be an amateur in the, in the realm of physical fitness and strength. Yeah, what a shame it is. And it's like, I feel like you can just copy and paste that exact quote and replace, replace strength and fitness with like anything. You know, what a shame it is for a man to grow old and never know the beauty of the guitar. You know, what a shame it is for a man or a woman to grow old and never know the beauty that it is to communicate with a foreigner. You know, or whatever. It could be any topic, you know. And I, or I just think that that's so transferable to every discipline. And it's like, yeah, it'd be a shame to at least, at least not spend a little bit of time on something just to get a bit of an appreciation. Not necessarily, like, I would hazard a guess, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that you don't have any plans or you don't have any uh, current intentions of becoming, like, the big, best guitarist of all time. You just want to play, enjoy it, get a bit of a deeper appreciation, be able to play some basic songs, and then that's yeah. it. You, and I think that's I think that's as valid as any any other reason to take up any other skill or hobby. I guess it's just and un, yeah to have that appreciation of and then because you can really understand someone at the top level what what it takes to get there. Mm, um, for sure. But without any context, it just doesn't mean anything. But I think one of the things you said in that video was don't don't take your lifting so seriously. And mm-hmm. what one I had I don't think you've mentioned this yet. Oh, sorry. The you made the video recently of the ten lifted uh, ten. 10 things juniors should know, um, which I, I liked. I really, you mentioned you that filmed in, the it in your, uh, you filmed it in your garage. It was, I liked it. And I related to pretty much every point 
um, that you said, but I actually found them, a lot of them transferable from lifting to mm-hmm. guitar as well. Like yep. it's those same principles apply to everything in life. And um, one of them was don't take life too seriously. And I was finding that I was taking my guitar, like putting so much pressure on myself. I have to practice every day. If I don't practice, it's a failure. Make sure you practice every day. And I found that about a few months, a few months ago in the first lockdown, I dropped that expectation. I was like, I'm just going to drop that expectation and just play the guitar when I want to play it. Inadvertently, I found that I was playing it more often and actually getting better at it because I wasn't putting all these expectations on myself to play. So and maybe like looking forward to doing it rather than looking at it as a chore. Is that yes, and that's what I was starting to look at it like. And I even start with lifting sometimes, look at it as a chore when it's something I really enjoy. Like I enjoy putting heavy shit on my back and lifting it. And I was putting all this pressure on myself. And I wanted to ask you, is that something that you have found with lifting, something you've done for a long time? Have you gone through phases where you put all this pressure on yourself and you actually stop enjoying it because you're just like, putting all this pressure to, to perform or to lift heavy weights or to, to, to meet a certain expectation? Yeah, I think, I think, uh, I don't know. I think I'm like, I'm just so deep. Like I'm so far into lifting now that it's not something that I would ever stop doing. And I'm like, I'm going to do it nonetheless, you know, and then I'm right when I can't be fucked doing it, but I'll still train. Like if I've got a program to do, I'm not going to not do it. And I think you're the same. Like when was the last time you missed a scheduled training for reasons other than illness or travel or something, right? Like never, probably never in the last five years. And um, I mean, I think that's where discipline comes in is you just do the training that you're assigned. But when you have this really high expect, but the thing is my expectations of myself are really low, right? Like I don't expect to add 10 kilos to my squat in six months. I don't expect to do this. All I expect of myself is to train hard. Hopefully I improve and I just enjoy it along the way. And when I say I enjoy it along the way, that doesn't mean I enjoy every training session. That just mm. means that I enjoy the process that is going to gym and training. But, um, but there was a time, obviously, when I was younger, when I was a junior, where I had high expectations of myself that I had to train, not because I wanted to, but I had to, but in order to fulfill this like, arbitrary goal that was to like, you know, break this record or hit a PB or you know, whatever it was. And yeah, that obviously sucks the life out of it. That sucks the joy, enjoyment out of it because you're no longer doing it for intrinsic reasons. You're doing it for this end result. You know? And I think um, one thing that's really relevant to this journey that we're both on, and I'm sure many of the listeners would be on too if they're doing other activities or trying to improve in other facets other than lifting or even just in lifting as well, is a quote that sits on the wall at Noble Strength Culture. You know, the, the journey is a destination. And that sounds like it sounds like what you've just described about your guitar at the start of lockdown is exactly that. You realize that you're not practicing guitar to get good at guitar, although obviously that is one of the outcomes that you're after. But it's the fact that your playing is fun. And once you can realize that the playing is the that's the point. The 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 getting better part is the is the destination. That's the point. Then you you can actually enjoy the the process that it is. Mm. Yeah, hundred percent. That that's a revelation I sort of had with this whole lockdown. It's been yeah, five months now. First lockdown, I really did struggle quite a lot training in the garage alone. I missed that that environment. I missed training with the other guys. You know, the, the social aspect of it as mm-hmm. well. And then obviously going, we opened again, as you would know. Um, and it was even worse the second time initially because it was like, oh, we got teased. We were open. Everything was, you know, I was in this good rhythm for a couple of weeks and then we shut again. And then I was like, you know what? Training something I enjoy. I'm not going to let the fact that I have to train alone in my garage wreck that for me. So I'm just going to use it as an outlet. It's, it's, it's something that should make lockdown more enjoyable. And I've noticed since I just dropped all those expectations and I'm just training, like almost when I first started training quite like five mm-hmm. years ago, just that fun excitement. That's what I'm kind of treating training as this fun, new, exciting thing and forgetting that I've done it for five years. And it has been, a lot more of a positive experience in this second lockdown. Um, so it's kind of like a blessing in disguise. Absolutely, like a silver lining. Like you, it kind of gives you the opportunity to reflect on something that you might not have ever yeah. stopped to think about or, or at least look at it from this perspective or this point of view. Yeah, 100%. I, I wanted to ask you, now mm-hmm. in, one of, in the video that we're referring to, number, point number four was cutting weight is stupid. Yeah. Now, for a long time, you were known yeah. as the guy that cut, like, and cut three kilos before a 
Well, what, what point did you start to go, hang on, maybe this isn't the best, uh, best way to go about cutting weight or making weight for a competition? Um, I think deep down I knew the whole time, which is the worst part. I think I knew the whole time and that I was in denial. But I also was able to justify it to myself because I was competing at a high level. You know, I was breaking world records. I was going to, I was winning worlds and stuff. So in that sense, I would say that it was almost justifiable. Like even now looking back, I would say that's justifiable. Like if I had a client that was in that position, you know, that was pushing for world records, pushing for medals at worlds and stuff, and they were too thin, like they had to go up a weight class inevitably. I would almost say to them still, like even now with my wisdom, if it's what you want to do, it's what you want to do. I can acknowledge that cutting weight consistently and staying light for so long probably hampered my long-term progression. Like I'm probably not as strong now as I could have been had I just put on the weight earlier, if that makes sense. Mm. But, but, I don't, but I don't regret it because those few years of me cutting weight so aggressively and winning worlds and doing everything that I did and achieving what I did is what launched my career i guess it's what launched my my uh, i guess name if you can even say that so i don't think i still don't think it's bad it just depends on the context you know like if if one of your clients is 74 kilos at 5 foot 11 and they're gunning for a 450 total at their next comp like in that context i would just be like dude what's the point like i'm sorry it's not i'm not trying to i'm not trying to like be elitist here but it's like if you're going to be shooting for a 450 total at 74 there's no point cutting in that context you know yeah. but again if someone's going for records if someone like it's funny because at the same time i also look at records and stuff with a much lower value than i used to you know i used to think like records were so this was such a big deal winning was such a big deal and as i've matured i think of them as less valuable but the fact of the matter is they, they have value they have societal value they have merit so yeah i kind of hope that answers your question i think I, I think in summary i've always known that cutting weight was bad i think as i've gotten older i've realized it more and I've just come to appreciate the, the context in which I would suggest it or encourage it or at least allow it versus context where I wouldn't. Yeah, well, I definitely think, as you said, you, you, you wouldn't take it back because it's made you who you are today. You've learned so much from those experiences. And at the end of the day, you're going to make mistakes early on and you're going to look back five years on and go, I wish, you know, I probably should have done that better or I could have done that. But you only know that now with experience. Mm-hmm. And I think one thing you said there was, you know, if you have a client that really wants to do it, like at the end of the day, it's their experience. Like yeah. lifting oh. is their experience. And sometimes the best way to teach someone a lesson is for them to cut weight. Let's say it's a hard way. Or whatever. Yeah. And they, they go, fuck, I felt like shit. And you go, cool. You're going to listen to me next time. And we're going to do it this way. And they go, all right, I'll listen. I'll Absolutely. Listen to you. I was exactly so, thinking that. I was exactly thinking that before you even started talking. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, you might, you, you had to learn through that route and now you've realized like, Oh, I get, I want to ask the record thing. What, what has made you change? What is your view on records? Cause I know you just said you don't have the same appreciation as maybe five, six, seven years ago. What, what has changed and what, what is your view on them? I think the value of anything is dependent on the, the value that you put on it yourself or the value that, that, um, that society puts on that thing, or at least what you perceive society puts, like what values you perceive that society puts on that thing. Okay. So like, as an example, like, uh, let's say there's like a $3,000 electric guitar that's on sale for a hundred dollars. Right. And you said to me, Hey, look, there's that guitar. It's just literally right there for a hundred bucks. You want to buy it? I'd be like, no. Because even though that's a bargain, to me, it's, it's useless. Like, it's literally useless. Like, it would just collect dust. i throw it in the bin after six months and, like, haven't even touched it, right? So, what I'm trying to say here is it's, like, the value of things isn't related to, like, what it's actually worth. It's related to what you see it as being valuable to you. And for the longest time, I put, like, records and medals and winning on this, like, pedestal that, that didn't exist. Like, I just made up that pedestal. To me, breaking a record was such a big deal. I, I remember in my bedroom, I used to have like all the Australian records, Oceania records, world records, juniors and opens, like in a table, like on my, in my bedroom, like posted on the wall. So I'd look at it every day. And I used to think that like seeing that every day would like motivate me. And to be honest, it did motivate me because that's what motivated me back then. But now it's like, 
I just care so much less about them. Like to me, the value is just less. It's not that it's not that records have less value. It's just in my my perception of their value is lower. And you know, if someone says to me like, "Oh, hey, I broke this," you know record or whatever i'll be like man that's awesome I, i'm not going to discredit anyone for the achievements that people make it's easy for me to say that when you know I, I can imagine some people might say oh it's easy for jp to say that records don't matter when he's broken many and he's had great success i can see that but what i'm saying is like if someone came to me again and said that they've broken records or they did some great achievement man i'll pat them on the back and say dude that's awesome that's a great reflection of your training and stuff but i'm not willing to like i guess make the sacrifices that i did or like put so much pressure on myself to achieve them because they're not as amazing as they were. Yeah. If I broke an Australian record now, which I haven't done for a long time, I think like one that I'm looking at is like a squat record. I'm only a few kilos behind that. And if, and when I can break it, I'd be pumped. I'd be like, fuck, that's awesome. But that's so much different to how I would have behaved five years ago. Cause five years ago when I broke a record, I was like, I thought I was king shit. I thought I was like the greatest, I was God's gift on, on this planet, right? Like I just broke the squat record. I'm the man. And now I'm just like, ah, oh, that was nice. And then I'll you know, go home and practice my Spanish and realize how bad I am at it and that I'm actually a pleb who doesn't know fucking anything about anything. It's humbling, exactly. I think the big thing that I've taken away from you just said is like early on, you're very outcome driven. Now you're a little bit more process driven. Like it's, and this is some self-reflection, self-reflection I did with, with powerlifting in lockdown one, and I did this with keep, Bryce. I just keep talking. I can I can hear you. I'll be one. Yeah, go for it. Um, talking, I I did some self reflecting on why I actually lift, and some of the things was like, well, I enjoy the alone time. I enjoy seeing myself physically get stronger at something. It doesn't matter how strong, but that improvement is um is there, and I feel like that's the important thing for me anyway, um, because, you know, as we said, the records, they're going to get broken again by someone else. Or, you know, they're not going to, they're not going to define you forever. They are, you need to be a bit more process driven. And when you are process driven, I feel you're going to get better outcomes anyway. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Absolutely. So, cause I, I know when I first started lifting, I was always like, Oh, there's this record. I want to get this record. I want to compete at worlds. I want to do and as I've gotten stronger, like the, the numbers I, I'm hitting now, four years ago, I would have loved to have been hitting. I don't care as much about those things at all. I just enjoy training because it's something I like to do. I don't care about breaking I records. Think- I don't care about competing at Worlds. I, like, I would still take those opportunities if they came, but they'll come Absolutely. when they come. And yeah. And I think like the important thing there is, like we're both kind of saying we've had a similar experience in that, We've, I guess, matured as lifters. And this kind of ties back to what you said earlier about how like you can't take away someone's experience. They kind of have to go through that. And you know, when I get like junior clients or yeah, people that are new, I guess, you can do records don't matter. Or bro, don't stress about cutting weight. Like you can tell them a hundred times, but they kind of have to go through it and then and um what's the word? They have to go through it and they have to experience it themselves because like you know, theory versus practicality is different. You know, like you can read it out of a book, but you have to go through it yourself. And, you know, like for example, I help manage the Powerlifting Australia Facebook page. So I get notifications and stuff from the PA Facebook page, people uh, sending direct messages to the Facebook page. And a lot of the direct messages come from people that aren't members of PA and they want to start Powerlifting. And like such a high percentage of them, this is obviously very subjective and I have no numbers and stats on this, just from my experience, such a high proportion of these messages are like, hey, I'm interested in starting powerlifting. Where can I find the records? I'm like, <laughs> why are you thinking about records? You haven't even started yet. But it's just like how people think. Like, and I'm sure this, I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will um will uh like recognize this or be familiar with this. It's like when you started, you're interested in like knowing the results from comps and like going, okay, can I be competitive or like, what are the records or am I close to this? And it's like, it's such nonsense, but you can't stop people from doing it because it's human nature to want to be competitive and to want to like measure yourself against others and say, okay, where am I? Am I good? Can I be good? And yeah, a lot of people, I guess, miss the like opportunity to realize, okay, no, this is just a learning thing. And, and they kind of learn it themselves, right? Like you can tell them and then three years later, they kind of realize and they say it to you, I'm like, no, oh, I told you three years ago, but 
I'm glad you figured it out now that that where you rank in a local comp or if you Oh, we got some. Uh, I get the. We had a bit of a, a, a glitch there. Oh, don't die on me, please. No matter. I can hear you there. Can you hear me? We good. Yeah. We had a we had a glitch there for a second. About fifteen seconds. Um, yeah, I guess it, it's it is the they they have to go through their own learning process, like everyone experience. Yeah, yeah. But I just don't. I don't. I don't get the record thing. Like looking at records, and as you said, you haven't even started. Like just start. Like it is funny, right? It is funny. Uh, but I'm like sure a, you're gonna too. I'm sure you get clients that start with you that are like, "Hey, I'm fifty. I'm fifty-one next year. That doesn't mean I'm masters. Doesn't mean I can break the masters record. I had a look. It's only one fifty, and I can do one thirty-five. Like. I'm like, okay, sure. Yeah. Well, oh, I don't even check. I haven't checked those um, those databases. I have clients that check and they're like, oh, you're sitting here and here. I'm like, oh, crazy. I didn't even know. They're like, oh, have you checked your new Wilkes? I'm like, I don't really care. <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. It doesn't change. It doesn't change anything for me. Like, um, There's only one friend that I just like to let him know that I've got a higher Wilkes in him, but that's an old high school friend that, do you know me Hindu? Have you met me Hindu before? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah so that, but that's just that's just friendly banter. So, um, but other than that, like, it really doesn't mean anything at all. I have noticed that, like, because we, we've been riding our push bikes a little bit, um, mm-hmm. and I do like to see what like the guys at the top, what their average speeds are, and stuff. Because again, context, I can I can look at mine on Strava how bad I am, and go and go, <laughs> yeah. how? <laughs> like I'm averaging anyone twenty three kilometers an hour. And these guys are on, sitting on 45 kilometers an hour for 20 days straight doing 150 Ks a day. I'm like, that's just crazy. But I, it's more just like, that. Your cycling speed is uh, Elliot Kipchoge's running speed. He runs no, that I, fast. I, I actually hours. said that. Yeah, I said that to Booz. I was like, man, no, I'm fine. averaging 23 kilometers. I'm like, that's what Kipchoge ran the two hour marathon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm yeah. like, so the other day I was riding and I was like, Kipchoge would literally be running next to me at the same speed. I'm like, that's. <laughs> Amazing. That's yeah. actually crazy. Did you watch that Breaking 2 documentary? Oh, man, I haven't actually. No, I've been meaning to. Maybe I'll do it this way again. It was the I one where they did, he didn't actually run under two, but he shaved like 40 oh, seconds off. Yeah, this is what yeah. he did with Nike and he ran like two hours, 26 seconds or something like that. Yeah, or something like that. And then he went and did it. It's pretty impressive though. Like, I just think anytime someone says that a human can't do something, they just seem to to prove it it's like humans won't run the 100 under 10 seconds they won't run a marathon and people just keep doing it and beating it yeah it's pretty cool yeah, i think that's like i think like this whole topic like what this whole topic is sending or centering around is yeah learning your skills and all that kind of stuff it's like i think that's reflected even in like my um social media feeds what i watch on youtube what i, I use a lot of youtube and what i look at on instagram excuse me i follow a lot of I follow a very diverse range of people. I follow people that like are just randomly good at stuff just because I'm so fascinated by human performance, not just physical performance, but just ability, I guess. Um, it's like you said, you know, when you look at the fact that the top cyclists in the world cycle at 45 Ks an hour for seven hours a day, 20 days straight, you're not doing that and feeling guilty or feeling bad, right? Like you don't look at that and be like, wow, I'm so terrible and you go home and cry. It's more just to be like, wow, like that's yeah. amazing. And oh, I- yeah, because I'm riding my push bike for a bit of fun. It's like, oh, cool, get a bit of aerobic uh, aerobic work, which I, I'm interested to see how that helps my lifting. Plus, it's just nice to be outside, fresh air and stuff. Um, it's easier on the joints than, say, other forms of um, aerobic work. But then you just look at... Then it's like, oh, well, I just want to see what these guys are doing. And it's it's impressive. Like It's crazy. Yeah, man. Like how fast they go up hills. Like they're going up, you know, these massive hills at the same speed I do flat on. And I'm like, that's just... And these guys are little too, like they're light, like they're little. little. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's, um, but I think the whole premise of this is just, it's about just enjoying the process of getting better. It doesn't matter what venture you take, um, you just enjoy getting better. And if anyone's thinking about starting a new task, like just do it. Like you're going to be bad at it. You're going to suck, but just start it. Just do it. Like the, the information is out there. Yeah, I think like the best source or the best source to start new things is like your own curiosity 
It's like wondering, like I wonder what it's like, or I wonder how to do this, or like, um, yeah, just having a, a sense of like, yeah, curiosity about something, and that's how you get started. And then, you know, there's no shame in doing something for ten hours. No, not ten hours. I'm sitting. I mean, like, you know, I say accruing ten hours of something, and then realizing actually, no, nah, I'm not really that interested. And you can stop. And there's no, no one's gonna, you know, no one's gonna blame you or say like, oh, you're a quitter because you're just curious and like you had your curiosity scratched and you can move on. I think one thing that I actually wanted to add to what you said earlier, like this is backfilling a good half an hour. Is you said about like how starting these new skills is very humbling. (laughs) We do this a lot, right? That's right. You you said it can be very, it can be very humbling. Yeah. And I think, and I think like the big, one of the big lessons that I've learned from taking up new skills is that for me, lifting was something that came very naturally to me. I was very good at it with, very little time and very little effort, like literally 17 months after my first comp, I won junior worlds. You know, not many people can say that. You know, I was very naturally talented at, at lifting. Um, but I'm not naturally talented at lots of other things. And trying to do those things and fumbling my way through the beginning stage kind of like, yeah, really puts you in that position where you're like, oh shit, it's not that easy for some people. One of the biggest mistakes that I see coaches make, uh, powerlifting coaches, I mean, are that a lot of powerlifting coaches tend to be good athletes or they were good athletes like me. And they kind of forget how hard it is for people who aren't naturally talented. And I made this exact same mistake. And it's like, you take on a client and you're like, oh, just do it like this. And then they don't do it. And then you don't know how to teach it because you never had to learn. Like I never had to learn how to hip inch. I just knew how to bend over. So when, when I was a new coach and I was trying to teach someone how to hip inch, I was like, just bend over. And then they round their back. I'm like, no, no, just don't round your back. And then they still can't figure it out. And like, as a beginning coach, it's very easy to be like, oh, you're an idiot. When really they're not the idiot. It's just like, <laughs> it's just not that easy for some people. And it's very much like that with, you know, for me when I was learning chess, which I started probably two or three years ago now. And again, like learning like a language, it's so hard. And it's, it's good to know that like, there are people that are so much better than you at what you're doing, right? There are people that are so much better at guitar than you are. But they don't look down on you. They don't like think, ah, that guy's a is a fucking noob. Like fuck him. It's like, oh, you're interested in guitar too. That's cool. We can be friends. And the same way, like I feel like that's what it should be like in powerlifting. You know, so there can be a bit of elitism in powerlifting where it's like, oh, if you're not very strong, then like I don't really want to know you. And it's like, man, you've got the same interests. What's fucking wrong with you? And not everyone is naturally talented. Like I know people that work their asses off for intermediate intermediate results. But that's okay. Like that's cool. They just they enjoy it. Yeah, and and learning how to as a coach, appreciate the fact that not everyone's going to be as talented as you were. You know, not everyone's going to pick things up like the way you did is, uh, I think, a very valuable lesson that all coaches should experience, I guess. Yeah, well, it's, uh, uh, it's just improving your ability to coach things. Yeah, and empathize, like you said before. I, uh, the first client I ever had, this was back at, like, well, well before strength college, so nearly six years ago, was probably the most, we call it motor morons, could not and it was my first pt session and i look back now and he couldn't do anything and i was like sweating and stressing out and so (laughs) and like i look back at that experience it's funny now but like fuck it was hard at the time but i kind of wish i could take that same person now through a session and see if i can just teach him how to deadlift how to hip hinge and see how quickly i could do it because it'd just be a cool reference point to see how much i've improved at teaching that those skills across six years or how ever long it's been but i find that funny because now now i've probably coached god knows how many people with the semi-private model that we run strength culture this i've had to teach so many different people well over i mean i can't even throw a number on over 100 whatever 150 people along with old clients and stuff and the first one has still been the hardest today (laughs) in terms of like he just had very little kinesthetic and awareness of how his body moves and Mm -hmm. it's very just yeah, very hard for him to pick up on 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 skills. So it'd be cool cool to see that now. But that's funny. That's really good. Yeah. There's um there's this TED talk on on YouTube by the way. I forget the guy's yeah. name, but um it, I think the name of the talk is something. It's about skill learning, about learning new skills. And he's he's the premise of his talk is basically that like you learn the most in your first twenty hours or something. And that it doesn't, uh, no, I think what he says is that, like, you know, to become a master of something, it takes 10,000 hours. But that last, like, 9,000 hours is you just refining your skills. Whereas that first part is, like, you know, it's like the typical, like, um, 
diminishing returns, right? Like at the start, you just get really good real quick and then it flattens out and then progress becomes slower and slower. And like his premise is that like you can learn a lot in the first 20 hours of something if you've never done it before. And that's something that really inspired me to take on new things because it's true. It's like, like let's use like, uh, let's use, yeah, let's use chess as an example, right? If you've, if you just know the rules and one of your mates just knows the rules and that's it. If you spent 20 hours like studying and learning, you would never ever lose to that your friend ever. Like you'd just be so much better than him because it all it took was 20 hours. You know, that's only like a couple of weeks, a few weeks of effort. And you'll be like head and shoulders above him. Same thing goes for like random skills like juggling or playing the ukulele or like whatever. If you just sunk 20 hours into something, you'd actually kind of like learn a little bit, quite a lot. And I think like going back to what we said about how to get started, he's like, just give it a go because you'll learn so much so quick. And that can be like the motivation to keep going. Well, that's actually something I found with guitar was make, yeah, just was learning very like uh, tasks that were just hard enough to challenge me, but also easy enough to, to be able to do them. So you get that um, sense of achievement sense of, sense of, yeah, and reward and you're like, oh, I want to keep doing this. Um, whereas if I picked a song that was like fucking really, really hard, I would be like, I suck at this, never going to be able to play. And it's just so I realized early to pick tasks that are, Easy, easy, easy enough to, to be able to do, but hard enough to, to challenge me to actually get better. Yeah, for sure. I think in language learning, they call it N plus one. You work at your level, but a little bit harder than that level and you'll improve. It's progressive overload. Bro. Progressive exactly overload. Like My love of Crota. I guess I want to move on to, we'll, we'll finish on this talk, but what's when gyms do finally open again you've been known the last few years to have probably one of the biggest comps in australia team champs mm-hmm. um last yep. year was last year was a pretty yeah pretty damn awesome comp uh competed there and i was uh i had yeah great time atmosphere was awesome was pumping in that place i definitely think that's something that powerlifting needs um to create that atmosphere but obviously if it can't happen this year what's the plan um going forward with that are you is that Man, something that you want? You're asking for you're asking for a big announcement. Is there a big, is there meant to be a big announcement? No, but I'm just saying you. It's like you're trying to get him like the. No, I was more asking like, what's the plan with that? Is that something that you want to keep pushing every year and make it bigger and better over the next five or ten years? Um, yeah, absolutely. Like, I guess yeah. Just on that topic of like, um, meat directing. I fucking love meat directing. I love posting comps. They're tiring. Mm but they're so, so rewarding because they get to give people that experience. Like what you just described is like, that's what fills me. That fills me with like joy to hear that from people. Um, I mean, that's why people compete. You know, that's why people enter comps is because they want a good experience. And I, and I feel like I've had enough experience myself as an athlete and, you know, done enough comps to know what that's like. So um, definitely want to keep growing it. Obviously, every day that goes past, the chances of Team Champs happening this year just become less and less, pretty much to the point of zero now. Although I haven't said anything because I guess there hasn't been like a definitive thing to like yeah. push it over the edge, but it, it's very much there now. We probably don't need a definitive uh, thing to well, tell Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's pretty... Exactly right. I mean, well, pretty... we never really announced that it was even going to happen, you know? It's never like I was like, oh, Team Champs is at this date and then had to cancel it. It's like, I'm, I'm not even cancelling anything. Right? So, <laughs> it's, yeah. But exactly. I didn't have plans. Like I had, I had a logo drawn up. I had um, orders placed like for things. Like I was already rolling. Even like in, in May, when we had lockdown, I was like, oh, we'll be, we'll be right by December. Uh, wrong. <laughs> I know. Well, my, so, yeah, my brother's wedding was meant to be in December. And, and, you know, when the gyms opened up and the restrictions were getting lessened in June, like, oh, it should be fine. And then it just, <laughs> like, five months later, it's worse than what it was. I know. At the start. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, I, I don't think, uh, yeah, so just, I don't think December will, will December will be yeah anything will be happening in December to be honest. So plan is to obviously keep running them. I want to make them an annual thing. My plan was always to make it an annual thing, make it like the biggest comp on the calendar, keep growing it every year. Yep. Obviously hurdle this year, but that's fine. Um, I think if you remember last year, the prize money was two thousand dollars. Yeah. Um, the the plan was to make the prize money this year three thousand dollars, which obviously is not going to happen. So. My plan was to just literally progress the prize money by thousand dollars a year every year. So I'm just going to keep doing that. Um, so next year's prize money will just be four thousand dollars, and the winner of Team yeah. Champs 2020 was coronavirus. <laughs> and um, and yeah, just grow it every year. And I want it to very much be a thing that like people go out of their way to compete at. Like 
Mm. I want it to be a, a competition where clubs, yeah, gather their best lifters and go where where lifters block it out in their calendar and say, okay, I'm going to do nationals and I'm going to do team champs. Um, and where lifters in clubs, like, yeah, like let's say for you guys, there might be someone that's like, you know, maybe like your fifth or sixth or seventh best, you know, like they're, they're like a reserve, you know, and then you as the coach of the, of the strength culture might go up to this person, whatever, and just like, hey, dude, like you're knocking on the door of getting on the team, you know, and if you really keep pushing, you might even earn a spot on the team. And then this year they don't make it and go, well, that's all right, next year you might make the team for us. And I want it to be like a prestigious thing for lifters to be like, yes, I get to represent my strength culture. You know, I want to do Jamie and Charlie and, and um, the rest of these guys proud. And Didier, sorry, fuck, I'm getting Didier. Um, and the same thing for, other, for the other, I was like, who's the other powerlifting coach? Um, and I want, to, I want that to be, that's what I want it to be. So yeah, definitely want to grow it over here, get bigger sponsors. I was even thinking about running in different venues and shit and fuck, whatever. So. What venues have lots you of, thought lots about? Of ideas, but want to go. What uh, what venues have you um, thought about? Like a theater has been what? Yeah. Has been what? Like a ven- like a theater would be good, or like an empty hall. Um, probably like my biggest consideration, honestly, has been an outdoor venue. So like uh, I like a park or something similar, where they have a stage. You know, some parks already have a stage there, for like you know, ca- you know, like uh, what do you call it, like. Cows by candlelight type of thing. They've got like yeah. a preset stage on a park, something, something like that. But that would be like really expensive because you've got to shift everything. You get a, you need to have audio visual there, and you need to have a crew to pack down straight away because you can't leave everything overnight. You know, and that's usually like you know that night we go out for a drink and that. So lots of ideas, but you know I'm a very ambitious person as you know. So there's no reason why that won't continue to happen, grow it and shit. So yeah. Um, yeah, I really wanted to run it this year because I feel like everyone needed it. Like, I feel like I felt like everyone needed a big comp because it's like, well, fuck, nothing's been. Guys, glitched there. If coronavirus, that's not to be. Yeah, so I just, it's just glitched there. I was assuming you were saying that you felt like you wanted to run it at the end of the year because it just gave a bit of hope and a bit of. Something for people to look forward to, especially with their training and mm, having nothing something, something really. Something to look forward to. Yeah. Absolutely. Which, that's what probably hit home the hardest not, for me. Just not to be, I guess. Was when we got Sorry. to the second lockdown and I was like, we're worse off now than we were at the start. <laughs> then we were like, three months ago. It was all for nothing. <laughs> oh, no. I was like, I just went into this very like existential state of mind. So, anyway, is what it is. Nothing we can okay. do about it. We're all in the same boat, which is a unique experience. Yeah, done. Well, I reckon we'll, we'll wrap it up there, man. That was a really good chat. Um, awesome, man. Thank yeah, you. if people want to find you, contact you for coaching or anything like that, where, where's the best place for them to reach you? Um, um, just contact me directly via my email. It's jkalfie at Um You can follow me on Instagram. Check out my YouTube page as well. That would be great. But um, yeah, on that note, thanks for your time. Gracias por tu tiempo, Charlie. That's it. And, I didn't um, ask for a bit of no, good fun. Good chat. Uh, thanks, man. Well, thanks for jumping it's so on. Di- it's so difficult. <laughs>